Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking with you today. Uh, it would have been even nicer to have been with you in person, but obviously with the current situation, that's just not possible. Um, so it is even so a pleasure to be able to present uh, some aspects of the importance of external quality assessment, or as you may know it better as proficiency testing. Both are the same um, entity. So, um, going to speak today for maybe about 45 to 50 minutes, and uh, we're not going to go into too much detail. It is very much a, an overview. And as Rebecca said earlier, so if you do have any specific questions on anything that I discussed today, uh, please put them down in the chat and we'll spend some time afterwards uh, going through those. Uh, okay, so let's press on. So, um, just from this image here, whenever we discuss trying to get a, a clinical answer to a clinical question, um, you can see there are many various aspects in getting that answer. Uh, it's not just the analytical side that we need to look at, because obviously there are pre-analytical and post-analytical phases uh, that need to be considered. And if I was to ask you um, to look at these various stages, uh, and basically uh, I'm sure you could tell me straight away of the different areas of risk and different areas for potential error to occur. And also, similarly, I'm sure you can tell me um, of the various uh, quality measures that you have in place in order to reduce that risk, in order to reduce the potential for errors to occur. And um, Really, what we're going to talk about today is one of those areas in order to reduce the risk of errors occurring. It's not going to stop errors occurring, but really what we want to look at is the reduction. Because what we, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, she said 70%. Certainly, uh, it has been informed about two thirds, certainly of information used by physicians to make their diagnosis comes from our laboratory testing. Now, if we get that wrong, what does that mean? Well, it can be a simple, okay, let's repeat the test. Um, however, we could go more seriously into misdiagnosis and then once again into inappropriate treatments all resulting in increased costs to our system. But more importantly, patient care may be compromised. And really at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to uh, ensure that we reduce the risk of patient care being compromised. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, from the most established laboratory to the smallest um, I've been to laboratories all over the world, and I can ensure you that they all have errors. So really what we're talking about today is uh, looking at a quality system, putting a quality system in place that will help to detect those errors quicker, therefore reducing the impact of that any error may have. As I said, we've had experience of errors um, and or different situations around the world. Uh, I've been involved in external quality assessment for about 28 years now. Um, I've traveled the world with Randox, looking, going traveling to different laboratories. And it's not that long ago that I've come across uh, situations like this on the left where you're simply looking at uh, your internal QC being jotted down into a book. Um, but obviously, that 
quite difficult then to be able to see a full picture. And that has progressed remarkably over the last number of years. Uh, certainly then, when you look at the image on the right, you should all be familiar with this. But with the progression of multi-rules, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with West Guard's multi-rules, but there, there are others as well, um, where you're looking not just simply is one result outside two standard deviations or three standard deviations, but where you're looking for trends, where you're looking at errors that occur across controls, um, depending what that is, all to try and reduce the amount of errors that are, or should I say, to try and detect the errors more quickly, and also then to try and make the system more efficient, so that you're simply not uh, looking at one result outside two standard deviations and saying that you're out of out of control, because naturally one result in every twenty should be outside of two standard deviations, because that's just uh, natural, and that's just statistics. So, as we say, laboratory control is not two-dimensional, it is multifaceted. Um, and uh, as we've heard already with the likes of uh, peer group reporting systems, we have had the development of other quality systems which give us valuable information. So, why do we need external quality assessments? Um, why is it important? Well, uh, first of all, let's look at ISO, the International Organization for Standardization. This defines quality management system as coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regards to quality. They are the organization that develop the various standards, ISO standards. And I'm sure uh, many of you will be familiar with this, the ISO 15189, which is the globally recognized standard, which specifically looks at quality and competency in the medical laboratory. It's there uh, for you to use. Uh, to assess your own competency, and it really focuses on improving patient safety, reducing risk, and increasing operational efficiency. The important thing to note is that then participation in external quality assessments is recommended for all laboratories, and it is actually required by those that are looking for accreditation to ISO 15189. The actual section then refers to this section 5.6.4, basically states that the laboratory shall participate in an inter-laboratory comparison, such as those organized by external quality assessment schemes. So, if for no other reason why you should run EQA, here's one straight away. Basically, it is not only recommended, but if you're looking to be an accredited laboratory, it's basically necessary for you to run. But it's so much more than that. Um, why run EQA? Um, why implement a an effective, uh, complete quality control package um, whenever it adds additional costs to your budget. However, if you look at it uh, and if you look at labs that have become accredited, you will always find that in the long term, it will decrease your costs, maybe not within the individual laboratory so much, but certainly throughout the whole system within your hospital or the circumstances that you find yourself in. So there is a decreased cost and increased productivity within the laboratory, uh, especially by eliminating the need to run unnecessary and expensive repeat tests. 
Um, once again, just to emphasize that we are looking to prevent then inappropriate patient care and or treatment. So uh, let's ask the question, so why is IQC or internal quality control insufficient? Uh, most labs, if not all labs nowadays, are all very familiar with your internal quality control and running internal quality control. But there are still different variations in this. How often do you run controls? Uh, how many levels do you run? Uh, how frequently or what rules should you set to determine if your uh, system is in control or not? Um, so I'm going to introduce then some features to you of external quality assessment, why internal QC is insufficient. Although it provides uh, useful information, or actually it's information that you cannot do without, um, but it's not the, the, the end of the story. There's so much more than internals. So whenever we look at then analytical errors, I'm sure we're all very familiar with then the two main ones for random error and systematic error. Random, um, to say uh, that there's no explanation after investigation isn't necessarily correct, but uh, we can all, sometimes we, we, we do find out what the reason is for the random error after we do the investigation. But what we're really trying to say here is that it is um, not consistent. So really what we're looking at here is systematic errors, uh, where you have a consistent bias uh, that is caused uh, outside of repeatability, where you're repeating the analysis. Um, let me explain it uh, slightly further. So whenever we're looking at um, any measurement, we look at both aspects. We look at the bias of the system and also the precision of the system, or imprecision and inaccuracy, to be more correct. So the formula here, the total error, is a combination of both. It's a combination of your bias and a combination of your imprecision. Whenever we look at it in terms of, uh, well, through this diagram here, hopefully you'll, you'll see the picture slightly better. Now I'm just going to bring up a, a pointer and then let's see. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to see the pointer move on your screen. So any measurement that you make, um, you repeat, the, you repeat analysis again and again. This will give you your normal precision curve. Generally, it will be a standard or a normal curve uh, with the mean of your measurements in the middle plus one standard deviation, two standard deviations, etc. And on the other side, minus one, minus two standard deviations. So this is your precision. And the more times that you repeat, then you'll get a general picture like this. However, this does not tell you anything about your bias. Your bias now is how far you are away from what the true value should be. So now, this is maybe a slight exaggeration, having the, the true value being so far away, um, but actually, uh, we have had many situations like this where the results have been so far away from what the true value is. So what we see here is any measurement that you, you make, then there will be the random variation that you'll have due to the precision of your measurements, but also then the difference between that measurement and what the true value is, and that you're uh, seen as the measurement error. So, what, what does that tell us? Well, basically, it describes that it doesn't matter how many times you rerun the sample, is basically it doesn't give you any information with regards to your bias. 
And that is really where we're looking at the role of external quality assessment, where we're trying to determine how far my result is away from what the true value should be. Now, uh, two more examples, which are sort of following on and shows you the impact of this. Uh, in this example here, we once again just look at a normal distribution. But let's, uh, in this scenario, let's say that you have a cutoff, and we we'll just say the cutoff here is at 40. Uh, in this case, basically what we're saying, uh, well, in this example, is that there will come a certain stage where you are 95% sure that your result is correct. So in this case, you have, uh, in this case, the result is 38.2. If that is where your normal distribution lies around, it basically means that uh, any result, or if you were to get a result higher than 38.2, you're, uh, no, well, less than 95% sure that you will have a false positive. So just to repeat that, um, so in this case here, once you go past by 38.2, then there's a there's a chance by looking at just your normal distribution that you will have a false positive. So you basically you have to have a result lower than 38.2 to ensure basically that you will not have a false positive. If you look at it in the other way around then you would have to have values greater than 41.8 in this case to ensure that it actually is a true positive result. This is all down to your normal distribution and down to your precision. But as you can see, it actually doesn't, your bias doesn't come into this. You have no actually idea of what your bias actually is just by rerunning the samples again and again. So, your bias may actually drop you down or it may actually bring you up. It's particularly important whenever we look at measurements around the cutoff. If, for example, we're looking at a, it's a positive result and you don't care, basically, if it's positive, it's positive. Uh, in those sort of situations, it doesn't matter maybe if you're one, two millimoles out or however far you're out, if you're only looking at whether it's positive or negative. It's more important once you're looking at the specifically round about the cutoff points. So, what does this teach us? It basically tells us that to reduce systematic error of a data set, you have to identify what the source of the error is and to remove it. And unless you do that, um, as it says here, you'll never reduce systematic error just by taking more measurements. So let's look at a few uh, a few different examples, because really what we're trying to achieve here is this: we're trying to improve our accuracy, not only improving our precision. So basically, all of our measurements are all close together. Not only improving our trueness, so basically that we're closer to the mean, but that we're both we're going to improve both trueness and precision, and basically we want to improve our overall accuracy. Doing that, then we will decrease our uncertainty. We will be more certain of the values that we are obtaining. So, a few case studies, as I said, about why run EQA. Here's, uh, um, now for those of you who are not familiar with, um, well, EQA reports, uh, in so much, or even for, for ourselves, our own uh, RICUS reports. Uh, most reports that you'll get from EQA will have certain similarities. Uh, you'll tend to have stats, you'll tend to have a histogram, and the likes of a Levy Jennings chart that you will see uh, similar to your internal QC. So, what do we see in this case here? Uh, in this case, we have a laboratory that has been running with a very strong positive bias. They've been running with this for a, a long period of time. So the question is, why have, well, 
there's several questions I would raise here, but one of the important things is, well, uh, why have they not taken any action about it, first of all? Um, why? Uh, well, that came up as whenever we asked them part of the questions. <laughs> they let it drift for so long because their internal QC, to them, it was acceptable. Whenever they looked at their internal QC, they were well within their range, and actually they were quite close to the target. They also were running a second EQA scheme, uh, and in this other EQA scheme, that they were also, their performance was looking uh, much more acceptable. Um, uh, just to go back to the previous slide, as you can see, these are really uh, every two weeks in this case. This is a bi-weekly, so as you can see, They've been running for months in this situation, uh, all because their internal QC was looking acceptable. Now, we asked, uh, we did some investigation with them. First of all, that's, we wanted to make sure, because they were running a separate EQA scheme, we wanted to be sure that the two were comparing a uh, like-for-like scenario. So we wanted to check that they were correctly registered. Obviously, if you're not correctly registered uh, in any EQA scheme, that means you may be compared to the wrong consensus mean or the wrong target value. So that's important to start with. Um, we also checked as part of that, that uh, we compared the results to other means. So just once again, checking that they weren't uh, registered incorrectly. Um, very often the case, and we will ask for confirmation of the method group. Um, and we were very willing to help just looking at um, the getting a copy of the IFUs, um, the insert sheets, just to, to help the lab, just to ensure that they are, they are correctly registered. And in this case, uh, they actually were. They were correctly registered. There wasn't a problem. So, moving on, we looked for internal QC data. Now, why we ask for this is because in many cases, and we'll see a few more examples as we move on, is that the internal QC results, uh, even though they may be within the range, uh, you may have a wide range. So, if they have a wide range, then you may have a bias, but it may not be as noticeable and it may be less obvious. Um, so we asked for a copy of the internal QC data. Uh, we also wanted to check then how they were registered in the second scheme. So we did a like-for-like -like comparison. Because they had quite a consistent bias as well, uh, we also asked them basically, were any correction factors being applied? So um, it was possible that uh, this may have been the issue. Or, once again, they may have had a calibration uh, value which was incorrect. So, um, in order to, to basically cut this uh, case study down, just to tell you basically what the answer is, um, that, that was the case. They were applying a slope, 10% uh, slope for their alkaline phosphatase. Once they removed that factor, uh, the performance improved uh, immediately. And here we see the example. So positive bias, they removed the factor, performance shifted dramatically. So the question is here was, why did the internal QC not show that? Well, actually it did in the first place. But what they have done, uh, this is a UK lab, by the way, just to, just to mention that. Um, what the lab had actually, uh, what the lab had actually uh, done in the first place is that they noticed the bias, but they didn't get to the root cause of the problem. So what they did was they introduced a slope, and then they actually then changed the target value for their internal QC. So once they changed the, the target for their internal QC, obviously everything then looked okay in their internal QC. So you could basically say that they were wrong, using the wrong value. Internal QC looked acceptable, 
uh, their performance on their other EQA scheme was also acceptable. Why was that? That was purely down to the metrics of the material that the lab was measuring in the other EQA scheme. So it, this brings up two points. First of all, internal quality control in itself, um, you can't always determine uh, that it has a bias because all you're really looking for here is your precision. You're not looking at bias. You're not looking at accuracy. Um, it was very easy for them to introduce another error into their system uh, because they didn't get to the root cause of the problem. The root cause was actually down to the material of the other EQA scheme. Because they were performing poorly on that other EQA scheme, this led to, down the line to actions um, that led to this problem. So, uh, that was one case. We also see many situations where we look at standardizations. Um, in this case here, this isn't specific to an individual lab, but to an instrument group. So, in this case here, we have lithium being measured on a vitro system. In this case here, this is represented by the bar. Uh, so, we had the wet chemistries uh, with a mean one, two standard deviations, and basically the whole of the Vitross group were showing uh, a positive bias. Now, just as we mentioned in the previous example, um, we also get asked the question about the matrix of the material that we provide. But we were uh, very confident that basically the material was fine. So what we did then was we looked at uh, individual patient samples. We measured these by flame photometry and also on the vitro system. And we were able to show that the system, the vitro system did indeed show a positive bias. We work with various manufacturers, and in this case here, uh, we worked with Ortho, and they adjusted their calibration values downwards over two slide generations. And once they had done that, you can see how the VTRO system then, um, then merged in with the other wet chemistries. Another example, sort of for standardization, is then in this case for testosterone. Sorry, testosterone spelt wrong there. Um, so in this case here, you can see a bimodal distribution. So you can see this group of Biomaria VDAS users, uh, but a separate group which is showing a much lower, uh, or it could be, a, well, in this case, a negative bias in comparison to this. But in this case here, this was due to a, a re-standardization of the kit. They actually introduced then a new kit which with a different standardization, because obviously the original kit had a positive bias. So one of the other main features with EQA is to help bring about standardization of methods. And we do work not only with our participants, but also with the various manufacturers in order to try and have standardization of methods. So as you can see then, over time, uh, they introduced this testosterone 2 kit, and basically everybody moved down. There's still one user up there, you can just about see uh, but the vast majority of the participants have all moved down into this new group. One of the other things that we always see with internal QC is wide acceptable ranges. And in this example here, this is one that a customer came to us um, commenting that their internal QC was fine, but yet their external uh, was showing a, a, a positive bias. So this is the Amelia's internal QC. This is the level two. As you can see, the internal QC was slightly low, so 
even within their internal QC, they were showing a slight negative bias. Um, but it was within their two standard deviations, uh, so they thought this was acceptable. Whenever we uh, look at that in terms of percentage deviation, we can see that the results were sort of falling between zero and 10%, or a few examples outside of that. The acceptable limits were set at 20%, two standard deviations, 20%. Whenever we look at the external, then on RICUS, uh, here we find that their results um, were more along the lines of that two standard deviations. Um, but however, whenever we look at that, once again, in terms of percentage deviation, we also see that uh, the results basically are falling between five and 10%. And whenever we, we match the two up, um, obviously, there were other internal QC points in between these measurements, but we did a comparison along the timelines that they ran their, their external quality assessment uh, samples. And as we can see, for the majority of the samples, they matched up very well. Obviously, there will be some random variation as well between the measurements at the time, but in a lot of cases, actually the results were very similar. So this is an important point uh, whenever you're doing a review of your internal QC is to ensure that the ranges that you're, you're setting actually are um, acceptable. If they're too wide, they're not going to be sensitive enough to changes within your platform. So what you may finish up with is then um, flatlining of your, of your results. So it needs to be sensitive. Of course, what we would say is that the ranges that you're setting actually should be your own. The, the values that a manufacturer supplies are only the starting point for whenever you're changing to a new lot of material. Uh, or whenever you're first starting off, you may want to use the ranges as a starting point. But really, in order to uh, look at day-to-day -day precision, you need to work out what your own precision profile is. And that's what you should be using to give you sensitive, uh, basically, information for uh, your day-to-day -day, uh, analysis. So internal QC, if you have wide acceptable limits, these may hide performance issues. Whenever we look at internal QC data, it's important to gather the correct information. Um, we always ask the question, if, if a customer comes to us uh, with potential performance issues on their EQA, we very often will want to look at their internal QC information. So how often is the internal QC run? Specifically at what concentrations? Because we want to ensure that we're looking at, once again, like for like concentrations. Um, Who is the supplier of the internal QC? Is it a first party control or a third party control? How are the targets set? Is it a running target or is it a fixed target? A running target, of course, then your performance may shift over time. It may not be as noticeable as a, a fixed target. And once again, how wide are the ranges compared to the EQA? Always do a like-for-like -like comparison uh, whenever we're looking at doing any sort of troubleshooting between internal QC and EQA. Another example, this case here, we had a lab coming back to us to say that their internal QC was perfect, but they had a constant negative bias on RICUS. Well, in this case, you can see that in general, yes, they do have a negative bias uh, on RICUS. If we look at their internal QC, once again, as I mentioned, the very first slide almost that we presented today, when we looked at 
how they were reviewing their internal QC, this is what they presented to us. So it wasn't in terms of a chart, it was in terms just of the stats. So um, once again, difficult to see. The target that they used was from the insert sheet. The mean was very close to the target, and they did have a good CV. The precision was good, it was less than 0.5%. Um, no result was ever outside one standard deviation acceptable range. So, looking at it in this terms, the internal QC was fine. Uh, their level one averaged out at minus 1.6, the level two minus 1.49. If we do a like-for-like -like comparison and plot that in terms, not in terms of standard deviation, but in terms of percentage deviation, here we find actually whenever we plot their internal QC, their actual performance on their RICUS in general was better, if not um, fairly consistent with what they were seeing in their internal QC. But it was the way that they were viewing their internal QC, uh, instead of looking at it in terms of percentage deviation, uh, which would have enabled them to do a comparison, then it was making their life more difficult. So, internal QC, in summary then, doesn't address your calibration issues. Any instrument systematic errors um, doesn't review your wide acceptable limits. And as well, whenever we're looking at control over full clinical range, uh, this is one of the reasons as well why we look to see, is it a first party control or a third party? Sometimes first party controls, uh, they'll set the, the ranges they provide uh, are quite narrow. Not always, but in, in some cases we have come across this, uh, where it basically makes the analyzer look better. So there is a recommendation that you would use a third party control. Um, but also, as we just mentioned, um, hopefully you will see that the EQA is also required. But um, it doesn't end there. So say, okay, we're, we're very much, uh, we know that we should run EQA, but what EQA scheme should we use? What features should you look for in your scheme? Well, there's a wide range of different aspects that you may want to look at. Obviously, the very first thing that we, we mentioned this morning, international accreditation, uh, you should be using an accredited EQA scheme. You want to look for a, a scheme that has a large number of participants, therefore giving you uh, a a confidence in the, the means that are being generated. Uh, you're looking for a stable and consistent matrix. Obviously, we want something which is going to perform just like our patient sample. We want uh, realistic ranges of concentrations. Obviously, the difference between EQA and peer group systems is that uh, EQA proficiency testing, the samples are assay blind. So you don't know what the values are. Frequent analysis, rapid feedback, and user-friendly reports. Why are these last three important? Well, it's because what do you do with your EQA results? They are there for a purpose, and the purpose is to try and determine what the problem is, but also to see if you've been effective in the resolution of that problem. So if you're only measuring a sample every couple of months, um, really, it makes it very difficult to see how effective any resolutions have been. So, just quickly going through some of these, just to mention a few points. Yeah, international uh, accreditation is important, if not necessary, for the 15189 accreditation. Accredited EQA schemes are the ones that you should use. Why? Well, it because it looks at various aspects in the performance and how an EQA scheme is run. You're looking at the samples, you're looking at the matrix, 
you're looking at communication um, with the actual uh, end users. There's a commitment to quality. There is a commitment to participant confidentiality. And importantly, you need to look at there shouldn't be any collusion or falsification of results. Large number of participants, as I mentioned, ensures an extensive database of results for analytical methods. It's a global representation of manufacturers, instruments, and diagnostic kits. Why is that important? Well, if you're part of a small uh, country, then you will obviously have less of those specific instruments that you're using in your country as you would see globally. So um, we look at both. So basically, we look at then the instruments and we can look at the performance of your instruments within your country. But that's very often very small numbers. So we look at it on a much larger scale. We look at how those instruments perform globally. Um, gives you more confidence in the information that's been provided. It increases your statistical validity. Obviously, we want to look at samples which are free from interfering preservative stabilizers. They need to be consistent. They need to be stable. Okay. This, just like that second EQA scheme we mentioned earlier, that was actually then the cause of a problem. If that doesn't give you information, um, which gives you correct information about your accuracy, then if you take incorrect action because of that, then you may introduce actually errors into your system. The ranges are important, both analytically and the clinical ranges should be covered. Um, and once again, important to hit those actual important cutoff points. Um, whenever we look at performance over concentration ranges, um, it's very often the case that you can see concentrations maybe at the high end, performance is much tighter, whereas at a certain lower concentrations in this example, the performance is actually uh, much wider, or vice versa. Here we have good performance at the low concentrations, whereas at the higher concentrations, you're actually starting, apart from this one sample here, you're actually seeing a positive bias at the higher concentrations. So, um, assay samples, or sorry, samples being assayed blind. Um, once again, this is a this is the use of peer group reporting. It's not the same. Provides useful information, and it is useful to have that in terms of a, for providing an, an optimum quality control system. But it's not the same as your EQA because it's not being measured blind. Frequent analysis. If the samples aren't being analyzed frequently and reports aren't being returned quickly, as I mentioned earlier, it could be several months before you identify any errors. So how do you ensure, if you have corrected uh, an issue, that it's been effective? And it's very difficult if the analysis isn't frequent. Last, or a couple of years ago, we looked at this comparison. Uh, in RICUS, we have two chemistry schemes, two hematology schemes, uh, two amino acid schemes. One runs uh, every two weeks and one runs on a monthly basis. In this case here, this is our clinical chemistry. Uh, the TDPA is basically our target performance assessment. It's target deviation for performance assessment. It's basically the CV at which 90% of our labs can, are, are able to achieve. And what you can see here is that basically for every single parameter, all apart from HBDH, that basically the labs perform better if they're running it bi-weekly rather than monthly. Uh, this is followed up not only on our chemistry, but in our amino assay, here we can see basically almost in every single parameter that the biweekly participants perform better than the monthly. 
finally, for the hematology, same again. So why is this the case? It wasn't um, anything to do with where the labs came from in the world. It wasn't anything to do with how new they were, whether they were long established labs that were running on the scheme or only newly on. Um, it did seem to come down purely to if they were running bi weekly against monthly. Why would you say that that's the case? It could possibly be that the labs that are running bi weekly are basically able to review the results more quickly, and by doing that, they're able to then do their assessments and they can see how effective any uh, corrective actions that they have put into place, how quickly that they have been implemented and then effective. That's one possible reason. But certainly it is the case that the bi-weeklies were running better than the monthlies. As all part of that, then you have to have user-friendly reports. So you want to be able to review your assessments and ensure that basically it's quick, it's easy, it's everything as visual as possible in order to identify any analytical performance. So the question is, do all EQA schemes meet the mark? Are they all fit for purpose? There are a multitude of different schemes on the market, um, as I'm sure you're very much aware, and they are not all the same. I think really one of the issues is what is the main purpose of the scheme? If it's there purely just to, to look at a policing, but basically if you're only doing it uh, for looking at an external agency in order to have a pass mark, then really you're not really fully engaging in the, all the various aspects that EQA can provide. It's really there as a tool for laboratory managers to review, to assess your analytical performance, and that's the important aspect. It's more than just having a pass. It's in order to improve your overall performance, to reduce your errors, and provide confidence not only for you, but also then for your clinicians who are basically working on the results that you're providing. In the uh, 15189 standard, once again, it mentions about participating, but it also mentions about monitoring your results and basically implementing your corrective actions when the control criteria are not fulfilled. So it's more than just participating, it's actually then implementing your corrective actions. So Running a scheme in itself doesn't lead to an improvement. You have to be able to uh, interpret, to understand your reports. It requires con conclusions to come to corrective actions and to be able to put effective uh, corrective actions into place. Um, a couple of slides just to finish. Um, really, this is we could do a whole different section on troubleshooting which we're not going to do today, you'll be glad to hear, but maybe next time we can do another session on troubleshooting. Um, but it's really just to say that don't be implementing corrective actions without doing the full investigation first. The worst thing you could do is just to make a what we would say a, a knee-jerk reaction without fully understanding what the root cause of the problem is. Ensure that you record all the actions that you take. Make sure that you can follow the trail. So all your maintenance logs, your reagent logs, make sure everything's signed and dated so that you can look for changes through the, throughout the quality system. There is potentially you may want to use something like this, which is a, an EQA performance checklist, which looks at various aspects from specimen handling, clerical aspects, all down to calibration, instrument reagents, EQA. Basically, if you have a problem, it's a simple list to go down to ensure that you've covered all the basic aspects. Uh, you write your conclusion, 
you put your remedial, remedial action and you sign it off to ensure that you have full traceability. Change one thing at a time. You don't want to change too many things as you go on. So you want to change one thing and then say if that's been effective. You need to get to the root cause. You need to find out what happened. But you really do need to find out what happened. Keep asking the question, so why did that happen? Keep asking the annoying question, well, why did that happen? You keep asking until you find out what the root cause is. Then you look to see, well, how can I prevent that from happening again? And then how effective have those corrective actions been? It is a team approach. It involves everyone, from the technician to the quality manager, laboratory director. Um, and at that stage, I'm going to finish. But basically, hopefully you'll have seen that there is a requirement for EPA. You'll see that uh, it involves not only uh, one aspect, but multiple aspects of your quality system. And also that it really is down to everyone. So thanks for your time for listening. And uh, now there may be questions I'll try to answer. Um, and if not, well, we'll, we'll soon see shortly.